from, from a young age, I was always kind of interested in the ocean. You gotta follow your curiosity if you are in basic research. Human curiosity is precious. It's a privilege to be able to sit here and understand and predict what the universe will do. It's uh, absolutely uh, stunningly fun to get to think about different deep questions. When you're the first one that sees the answer, you think, wow, I'm the only person on the planet who knows this. Uh, research at the level that we, we did it here is, is always very new. We always try to push the boundary on things we don't know. If you want to be a top research university, you got to master the basic research. I am a chemical oceanographer. I work at the boundary of chemistry and biology. And I'm interested in phytoplankton, which are like small microscopic plants. The vast majority of phytoplankton in the ocean are serving a big ecosystem function by taking CO2 out of the atmosphere um, through photosynthesis like a tree would. Every second breath you breathe is produced by phytoplankton in the ocean. The fact that such a small organism could um, actually oxygenate our planet, my mind was blown. I use mass spectrometry, which allows you to look at um, the continuum of, of molecules in a sample. And what we're looking for are biomarkers. So can we tell who's there? Can we tell who's eating who? Or who is starving from um, not enough nutrients in the water? Using almost like forensics of the ocean by looking at these biomarkers. So by understanding how they're interacting, we can get a better understanding of the fate of the carbon or oxygen that's going through the ocean. The most baffling fact about the universe to me is that most of it is in the form of dark matter, dark energy, black holes. So I look for very massive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Since black holes are black, you can't see them directly. So I use stars that give out light that orbit very close to the black hole in order to infer whether there is a black hole at the center of a galaxy. We use spectrographs on telescopes to measure how fast these stars are moving near a black hole. You can see the velocities going up. It's indicated by the brighter color. That's where we think the black hole is. So the faster the stars are moving, the more massive the black hole is. Black holes have enormous impact on the galaxies within which they live. So they change the shape, the color, everything about the galaxy. To understand galaxies, which are building blocks of the universe, you need to understand the black holes to understand the universe. So my research is studying the uh, quark gluon plasma. The quark gluon plasma was part of the phase right after the Big Bang as the uh, universe expanded and cooled. And there are uh, discussions that go on as to whether the properties of the quark gluon plasma had any effect on the structure of the universe that we can observe now. If you want to make a quark gluon plasma, you have to cook matter to four trillion degrees. And we do that by colliding nuclei at uh, accelerators known as colliders. Deep inside protons and neutrons, we know they're made up out of quarks and gluons. We use heavy nuclei, and when those gold nuclei or lead nuclei collide with one another, you see a spray of thousands and thousands of particles and those particles are made from the quark-gluon plasma. 
The first thing we do is you know, count them and look at the patterns of their emission, and from that we can actually figure out the properties of the quark gluon plasma. We were absolutely astounded to find that it uh, flows beautifully like it had no internal friction whatsoever. And uh, that's why when we first discovered it, we called it a perfect liquid. Berkeley is one of those places that has been for the last 50 years probably the center of my field of research. So the field is a, a subfield of applied mathematics, which is called computational science and engineering. It's a way to solve the equations of physics and laws that, that physicists have developed computationally on a computer to be able to, for example, predict airflow around aircrafts. So I can predict the outcome based on all these techniques from mathematics and science and physics. We can do simulation. The wind is, is hitting the wing at a high angle of attack, which means that it leads to these enormous vortices and, and it's a turbulent flow in behind there. And, and this could, for example, be an aircraft that take off or in, and under some extreme circumstances. That's pretty embracing, I think, because it gives you the power to predict. Although we talk about applications, I am not the one actually sitting at the, the company that is designing these wind turbines and actually designing them, right? We provide new methods. That's what research is. Berkeley is the premier public research university in the country. Research is really part of the intellectual endeavor. This reputation Berkeley has means that we attract a strong faculty in the field and also strong grad students and, and postdocs. My graduate students and undergraduates, um, they're just so smart and really hardworking. They have fresh ideas, new perspectives. So that's just really refreshing and um, gives you know, new perspective to our work. Our students and the faculty, we together create an environment that nurture deep thinking allows us to try things, and it's okay to fail because we learn from why things didn't work. It's hard to predict what's going to come out of it, but the potential payoff is enormous. If you're going to be a research university that is very uh, well regarded and does a great job, basic research is very central to that effort.